Um, but just first, by way of kind of setting the table for the discussion that we're going to be having today, um, over the last several months, we have been working at Palmetto Policy to convene a group of like-minded education advocates and groups from all over the state. We call ourselves the South Carolina Coalition for Education Opportunity, and the uniting principle of our coalition is a passion for deep, sustainable, student-centered education transformation in our state. And I think that that phrase student-centered is something that you're going to hear repeated a lot today. Um, if there's one thing I think we can all agree on in terms of education funding in South Carolina, it's complicated. Bipartisan agreement on that. Years of really, I'd say, well-intentioned policy making have built up to create a system that is really stuck in an agrarian past and that's hamstrung by a maze of overly prescriptive, if well-intentioned, programming directives from Columbia and Washington. Um, I freely admit that we have a very ambitious goal today, which is to cram into two and a half hours or so what we could talk for two and a half weeks about and not be done with. So I hope you all have your listening ears on or going to listen fast to what we're going to talk about. Um, our game plan, like I said, is to, is to really take a big picture view of how we currently do funding in South Carolina, both for traditional schools as well as charter and virtual schools. And then, of course, we have a new piece in the Special Needs Tax Credit Scholarship Program that you all in acted over the last two years via the budget. Um, but before we do that, we're going to hear, like I said, from some great national policy leaders that I'll introduce to talk about funding and governance reform innovations that are delivering real results in terms of student outcomes in other states. Working backwards um, from the big goal of creating an education funding system that is simple, equitable, and focused like a laser on student achievement, I'd like to kind of just set the table with three overarching principles that will kind of set a framework for what we talk about today. The first is autonomy at the school level. Like I mentioned in my presentation to the House Committee um, last week, our default position in education policy is that we're always going to tend towards how do we push dollars and decisions back to the classroom level, the family level, and ultimately the student level. School leaders and teachers need to have the room to be entrepreneurs and to innovate to meet the unique needs of their student populations, as well as, of course, their, their individual schools and communities. But clearly, we're here today because autonomy has to be partnered with accountability at the state level. We have to have clear metrics to measure what works and what doesn't, and then in creating accountability and measurements, we have to ensure that we're measuring the right thing, which, of course, in the case of education, we'd argue is student outcomes and student success. And so that's why we're looking around our state and around the country, really, for best practices that we know are creating high student achievement. The third principle, equity for students. Clearly, we know that there's a wide disparity between many of our communities and the tax base, and we believe that the state funding formula should be the primary mechanism whereby we can evaluate and weight the different factors related to the disparities that we find in our communities in South Carolina. Um, I don't think it's a stretch to say that these three, the these three themes line up very well with the recent Abbeville case um, in which the court went out of their way to highlight that there is a clear disconnect between the inputs and the outputs in our current education system. They go on to say that the funding scheme in South Carolina is fractured and it's denying students in the plaintiff districts the constitutionally required opportunity. And they go on to say that the winner is not the districts themselves, but the students in those districts. They further hold that the plaintiff districts are capable of improvement, and the, but the institutions within these districts are largely unfit to provide students with the constitutionally mandated opportunity. So all of that kind of leaves us with the question of where do we go from here? And if there's one thing that you take away from this whole presentation today, I'd like it to be the word opportunity. Because what I see in Abbeville is a clear rationale and a golden opportunity for us to do a global systematic rethinking of how we do education governance and funding in the state of South Carolina. We know we're talking about seismic shifts here and necessary change is going to be a systematic process. It's not going to be something that happens overnight. There's certainly going to be questions, fear, opposition from people who fear change, 
or more cynically have a vested interest in kind of maintaining the status quo. But that doesn't excuse us from having the courage to lead boldly, and it certainly doesn't mitigate the urgency of addressing these needs before we lose another generation of South Carolina students. Status quo thinking is what's gotten us to the point where we are today, and status quo thinking is not going to pull us out of the ditch. 